I heard. Great. Uh, I assume that clap was for the Holy Spirit to talk to us this morning, right? And not for me, because I cannot take that glory. But you know what? I am so glad. No, my daughter told me a word. I am stoked to be here. Yeah, I used it. There you go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And God bless you for being here. Let me just pray very quickly. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for this day. We know, you know we're going through so many things, but we've come here, Father, to hear your word because we know <laughs> that your word sets us free. And this means we want to be set free from whatever we're going through. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you already are here. You've already started ministering to us. I ask that you just touch our hearts, open up our minds, and just cleanse us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Yeah, like I said, really stuck to be here. Yeah, sorry, Tamara, I'm going to use this all the time now. <laughs> now, the, the title of today, so mind if I switch this off? It's kind of awesome, thanks. Title today is No Longer Slave to Sin. And I'm, yeah, I'm so happy, you know, no longer slave. I am not a slave to sin. And I just want to tell you that you are not a slave to sin. One of the things that we Christians struggle with a lot is sin. We are Christians, but we struggle with it. But for some reason, it's not mentioned, so I'm mentioning it out now. And as I am saying this, if something's coming to mind that you know that holds you down, I don't want you to feel ashamed, but I want you to be encouraged, because if you didn't know, now you know that you're not alone in this struggle. But I pray in the name of Jesus, but that, that by the end of this, you will know that you are no longer a slave to sin. You are no longer a slave to sin. I want to start by... We're going to go through the book of Romans chapter 6 for the first half, half of the verses, I think up to 16. And then this, this guy, Paul, who wrote this book by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks about how we can understand how we're no longer a slave, how we can overcome the things that are tend to hold us down, and that's what we're going to do. But before I do, I want to take one step back to go back to Romans 5 that uh, Mark preached last week. You, 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 should, you should listen to this because it was really good. The verse that I'm going to read is Romans 5 and 21, and it says, So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Basically, what, what happened last week was Mark, Mark ex explained that it is because the sin of one man that we are all born to sin. And, and it is because of the obedience of one man that we are set free from that sin. Now sometimes when we say that all have sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God, when you talk about everyone has sinned, people will say, you don't know me. I'm a good person. I don't sin. But I want to give you a really good example. Two-year-old child, some, for some reason it starts from one and a half, two-year-old, especially when they're girls, they start getting a bit sassy. Have you ever noticed that? You know, you're talking to life and you're like, hey, you come here. And you wonder, where did that come from? Who taught them that? And we were talking about boys. Boys are even worse. They'll wait. I'm not mentioning anyone here, but I'm just saying. They'll wait. <laughs> You're not looking. They're going to do something really naughty. Maybe go push the sister. Run away and act innocent. And when you talk to them, they're like, I didn't do it. How do they know that they did something wrong? Where did they get the idea that this is wrong? But thanks to parents and carers that these children don't grow up like that. Because we teach them to do right. But if you imagine, if we never taught them to do right, they will continue going being bad and bad and bad. Where does that badness come from? Where's that, where's that thing come from? It's what we were born with. And that's what was being explained when we were talking about Adam sinning and it's been coming on to us. But this Jesus, who was a prophet and known to be the son of God, who died on the cross, and the whole reason that he did that was to say that, I'm taking you away, you sin. I'm giving you this thing that we call grace, this gift that I'm giving you of righteousness, so that 
When you believe in the things that I've done and believe in me, you no longer are a sinner, but you are made right with God. So that takes us from, he takes away this thing that we had in us and brings us up to a new place where we are no longer sinners. And this is where we are, and this is where I want to start. Because in Romans chapter 1, Romans 6 and 1, he asks a question. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of this wonderful grace? What does he mean by that? How do I explain this? You see, when, when that child that I was talking about, that two-year-old, he goes to his father, and his father forgives him. Does that give that child the right to do that, that again? It doesn't. And the child realizes that eventually when they're grown and they're more mature, of course, they realize that. And that's the same with us. So what the Bible is saying is that God has forgiven us all our sins. But, and because he has done that, it doesn't give us a right to then continue into sin. But the reality is, you and I know that even though we are Christians, even though that we are saved, even though that we know Jesus Christ and what he's done from the cross for us, we do on occasion sin. We do that. Every one of us have our own little vices that tend to hold us down. And these are the things that I would just want to use this chapter to bring out and to strengthen ourselves to know that we can overcome these things. Amen? Yeah. Great. So what Paul does, he says, he starts bringing in this, this idea that because we are connected to, to Jesus, then we have the right, we have the power over sin, and sin has no power over us. And it starts building us up from bringing in the concept of baptism in chapter, chapter 3, verse 3. Um, yeah, so I'll start again with verse 1. Say, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in sin? And verse 3 says, Or oh, have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ, Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death. So he says that you've got to understand where you're sitting as a person. He wants to use the idea of identity to be able to show us who or what we are supposed to do. Here's an example. Prince George, you know, Prince George third in line to the throne here. That young man, young boy, say he's hanging around with his friends and what he likes to do is going to shops, stealing a little, bullying some kids on the side. You know little things that little boys sometimes do when they get too carried away with his friends? And someone stops him and says, sorry, uh, Prince George, I want to tell you something. You're a prince. And what it means for you is that you're in line to be a king. One day you are going to be a king. So the things that you're doing now are not necessarily for you because you're different. You're different because of who you are now and different because who you are going to be. And now because George now realizes that, hang on a second, yes, I'm an eight, eight, I don't know how old he is, eight, nine year old, but I'm, I'm a boy and I'm doing the things that sometimes boys, boys tend to do when adults are not looking. I should not be doing this because of who I am now and who I am going to be. And that's this thing, that's, that's, that's what Paul is bringing up to say that I want you to understand your identity in Christ Jesus. And because of that connection you have in him, it will allow you and it will make you understand that the things that we do sometimes, we have the right to say no to them. And it brings in the concept of baptism. Baptism comes in with John the Baptist, crazy guy, he was Jesus' cousin. Uh, and he used to wear, well, animal skin and all that, hang around in, in, in the wilderness and, and shouts all sorts of prophecies. And one of the things that he, he, he said, we was telling the people this, he says, I want you to repent. And then when you repent, to show that you have repented, I want you to come and be baptized in water. The baptism in water was taking people, immersing them in the river and taking them out. So that then was an indication that they have been what? 
cleanse of their sins. You've got to understand the history of the Israelites. Way back then, starting from Leviticus and the law of Moses, law of Moses because Moses gave you not necessarily his, God gave to Moses to give to the people. He taught them that for your, your sins to be forgiven, they would take a lamb, the goat, sorry. He would put, he would put his hands on the goat and the goat would be set free. That's where the scapegoat came in. And there are times that there were also sorts of uh, offerings that they were being done for the what? For their, for their sins to be, to be forgiven. So for them, it was a transition from that to a start to understand that the whole immersion of water and coming out, for them it was like, I've said I've repented, but for me to show that I am repenting, I am doing this. It was a sign to them. Jesus also said this in Mark chapter 16 from verse 16. And this is what he said. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. I want to make one thing clear. What Jesus is saying here is that I want you, when you're saved, when you're saved, I want you to be baptized. It does not mean that baptism is a requirement of salvation. No. But baptism, as then was what John was saying, was that baptism is something that I want you to do as a sign that you are saved by me. And that's exactly what it was. In Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 37 and then 38, we see Peter, when he stood up and he spoke and 3,000 were saved, he said, uh, in verse 37, it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostle, Brothers, what shall we do? So Peter preached to these guys. And these guys realize we need to be saved. And they asked, what shall we do? And Peter said, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, baptism is something that we must do. Jesus gave us two commandments. One, communi communion, which we do on a regular basis. The other one, he said, you must be baptized when you are saved. So salvation is, is, is a, oh, sorry, baptism for us is to show us that, how do I put it? The faith that I have in Jesus when I am saved, I put it into action by being baptized. And then Paul uses this baptism to say that you have to understand that in your, in your baptism, when you go into the water, it is as if you're identifying yourself that you are dying to Christ. And then when you rise up, you also rise up with Christ. But you've got to look at how Christ died. Christ died a sinner. Did you know that? On the cross, he took all of our sins, yours and mine and all those people's long ago. When I mean yours and mine, this is what people struggle with, and I just want to make this clear. Jesus died over 2,000 years ago. All right? And the time that he was dying, he took your sins and my sins. So the sins that he took of yours are not only the things that you have done from yesterday backwards, but also going forwards. So everything that you have done, ever done, or even, even thought of doing, God has, Jesus has already forgiven you. So when he died, he took all of that and he took it to the grave with him. But when he came out, he never came out with those sins. He left them there. So he came out a new person. So what Paul is saying is you've got to understand in your baptism, when you died and you identified yourself to Jesus, when you died, you went with your sins under the water. And as you're coming out, even if it's a symbolism, we work by faith, but even as you're coming out, you're coming out a new person. That old person is still in the water, dead in the water. And that's why he says, do you not understand that you're died to sin when you identify yourself with Jesus in your baptism? And that's where the concept of born again comes in. So your old person is dead. Now you are a what? You are a new person. You are born again. I just want to throw this in. This is a very interesting thing because one of the things that uh, we as Christians don't take baptism seriously. I, I, I read a book, um, A Dead to Call Him Father. Oh, I've forgotten the woman's name, but she was a Muslim. She was a Muslim, but she, turned, she converted to Christianity. And when she told, she never told her, her relatives and things, her friends, but when they realized that she started reading the Bible, and they started uh, just talking to her, you've got to stop what you're doing. 
you know, because she knew she was being converted, they knew that she was being converted. So even when she came out and she said, I'm a Christian, they used, just used to talk to her, they would talk to her and say, look, stop it. But the day she got baptized was the day that cut her off completely, because they understand the power of baptism. There was a Hell's Angel, a Angels member, you know, the bikers, they've got the, smart, they've got the tattoos and all. And he, this guy had a tattoo showing that he, 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 believes, in Jesus, he believes in Satan, He's, he worships Satan. But when he got converted, he wanted to be baptized, but was ashamed of that. But he said, I'll do it anyways. He went into the water. When he came out, that tattoo was completely gone. That is a symbol of when we die to Christ, when we come out, we come a new person. So the new person that's sitting there, if you've given yourself to Christ, is not the same person that you were. So the temptations that come, you've got to understand it, and this is the part that I love the Bible most. It just brings out, verse 6 of, 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 yeah, verse 6 of chapter 6. It says, we know, you've got to know this, we know that our old sinful selves was crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power over us because the old me is dead. That means the new me is what? Is dead to is new is alive in Christ Jesus. Have you had grown some of your friends? You have friends that you don't hang around with anymore because you've outgrown them. Even when they come and say, hey, 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 let's hang around, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm cool. Your friends, what's I, I grew them because you have identified yourself who you are now, and you see where you were before. And this is what Bapti this is what Paul is saying that you got to understand when you were when you when you were saved and you believed in Jesus that old person that used to do all those things is dead. This person that stands before you, this person that is here, is a new person. And now because this person is a new person, he's not going to do these old things again. And, and and reality is, you and me, we're still tempted to do all those things. I know I am. I was I was saved at what 35 years old. So there's still, th yeah, you didn't know, now you know. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a whole host of like 35 years to get rid of. But 99% of that went when I gave my life to Jesus. The little things that come in every now and then is that old man and that has been crucified that wants to come out. But because when I read this and I realized that there are two people in me now, you gotta, there are two people, there's an old man who is a sin, sinner and there's a new man who is who's saved. Now, this new man who is saved doesn't realize that this old man is gone. So that when, this, they, they, when the temptations come, I want to do them. You've got to understand, how do I say this? When, when, when I was a sinner, there were things I used to do without thinking. Because it was part of me, and I used to do it without even, without even batting an eye. I didn't have to think of them. When I became a born again, when I became a Christian, I would want to do those things, but they never came in the same way. They came as a thought, they came as an idea, they came as a temptation. The reason why they're coming out like that is because everything in me and on me realizes that this is a new person, and we just can't come in the same way. So they will come with a suggestion, they'll come with a temptation. And here the Bible says, you have the power to say no. He says, we know that our, once you know that your old sinful self was crucified with Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. You have the power to stand up and say, depression, yeah, I used to be there, but now, no. That power to say no. It, it, it's like... It's like a lion that's been caged in a zoo for so long. They take it out into the wilderness, they open the cage. The lion is still there, it's not going to move because it's used to being there. But the instant it realizes that I am free, there's absolutely no way. In Malawi, we used to have dogs. We, 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 but we, we, never, we don't do it like here where you keep him in the house. We used to be outside and you put him on a leash outside. You know, he'll be there maybe all day because he's, you don't, when, when visitors come, you don't want him jumping on them. But the moment you unleash that, 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 that unleash, and he knows that he's free, he runs up and down because he realizes that he is free. You and I have to realize that we are free from, we are free from sin. You could, w w w 
Verse 7 says, For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. That two-year-old, that's got the rebellious nature in them. I want to show you something. Isaiah 1, 5 and 6 God brings in the nature of rebellion and the punishment. He says, why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel, rebel forever? Your head is injured and your heart is sick. You are battered from head to foot, covered with bruises, wires, welts, infected wounds, without any soothing ointments or bandages. If you look at the, 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 if you look at the, 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 the injuries in there, head injured, Jesus wore a thorn, or a thorn of, on, on his head. His head was injured. Heart attack. Your heart is sick. They said he died of a heart, or a heart of, he died of what? Sickness in the heart. That's what medics say when they look at what, whatever, at his injuries and things. You're battered from head to foot. All, all, all those injuries are what, God, was what Jesus went through. And then in Isaiah 53 and 6 says, All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Everything that I used to do, Jesus has taken it. And I have no right to go back to it. But we get to realize that that's, that's what's happened. Now that we know that it has happened, we have the right to say no. We can resist the devil. And the way you resist the devil is very simple. You say no. And it's easy for me. But you know, when I was younger, like much, much younger, early 20s, that, when we used to date, there were two types of girls. You go to the girl and say, like, hi, hell, what's up? And they're like, ha, ha, ha. Then you're like, okay, I've got a chance with this one. But then there were the others, like, hi, what's up? What do you want? You're like, eh, I've got to step away from this. The difference is in the tone of the person you're talking to. If you're saying no to something when you're not really sure that you're saying no to, it'll keep coming back again and again and again. But if you say no to your anger, says no, I am not doing this. When you have the urge to want to take those drugs and you say, no, I am not doing this because of a new person, that thing's not going to come back. It will come back, but if you keep saying no, you'll grow stronger, it'll get weaker, and you will not be able to do that again. And that's who we are. And that's what Paul is saying is, our slavery to sin was bought by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Our awareness of it is in understanding that the person that used to do this is dead. Yeah. The person that stands here is a new person. And because I am new, I don't have to do this. I can say no to this. Romans 6, uh, let me just finish this. Verse 12 and verse 14, it says, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. It is our hands it is our feet, it is our eyes that start to start getting us thinking about the things that we used to do. But he says, now let us use these things as to glorify God, as weapons of God's kingdom and not, not of ours. Have you ever seen, let me, I'll finish with this, I promise. It's an old movie, uh, um, Double Jeopardy. Yeah, Ashley Judd, Tommy Lee Jones. So basically, this, this woman was accused of her, of her husband's murder. And she was tried, she spent time in jail. Only when she comes out to realize that the husband is not dead. So the husband's faked his death so to, get his, to get the wife what, in prison. She steps out to revenge. And she eventually kills the husband. But you know what happens? She doesn't get arrested. Do you know why? Because she's already served time. Yeah, so it is, it is, it is, <laughs> so it, it is a, it is a pro procedural defense that prevents an accused person from being tried again on the same or similar charges in an, in, or following an acquittal. You and I, the sins that we've done, because we identify, we identify ourselves with Jesus, Jesus took all of those sins on the cross and he took our punishment. So for intents and purposes, all the sins that I have done, I am doing, I'm going to do, I've already, Jesus has already paid the price. So Jesus has already gone to court, has been tried for the things that I have done. 
Do you understand that? So therefore, in the court of God's law, God cannot come to me and say, you are do this and this and this. He can't because the judgment's already been done. The punishments are being served. It's just that I didn't take it, but Jesus take, took it for me. So the question is, now that I know that before God, he cannot punish me for my sins anymore. Do I, when I am in Christ Jesus, when I am in Christ Jesus, does that mean I want to continue doing the things that I used to do in the past? And the answer is an emphatic no. What we need to do is to, we need to grow from that. And I tell you what, and I tell you from the bottom of my heart, I'm not speaking something that I don't go through. I'm not thinking something that I don't experience. I'm speaking that I go through every day. To make a decision, to not do the things that I, I want to do, or this, the old self wants to do. And the way I tell myself is that I am a new creation. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am a child of God. And because when I keep saying that, when that anger starts to come with me, it won't come any longer because I'm saying I am child of God. Whether it is depression, whether it is addiction, whether it is whatever, whatsoever things that you're going through, I just want you to understand this. If you say no because you understand that you are a child of God, you will overcome it. You will no longer be a slave to sin. If we continue walking in that sin, entertaining it, then no, Jesus is no longer our master, but that, slave is, that, that sin is a what? Is our master. Praise God for that. Amen. This is my last verse. I'm not going to promise. Joshua 24, 50, 14 and 15. Um, I think the worship team can come up now as, as I'm reading this. It says, So fear the Lord and save him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worship when they live beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. It says, But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you serve. If you don't serve God, and trust me, you are serving someone else. So you need to make a decision right now. Who are you going to serve? Am I going to serve God or am I going to serve whoever? He says, would you prefer the, would you prefer the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or will be the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you live today? But as for me and my family, I will serve the Lord. I pray that will be your decision to take. But know this, that sin has no power over you. God bless you. Amen. Amen.